Welcome to the Stories from the Street podcast from the Toybox charity. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Toybox is a non-profit organisation supporting street children in Latin America, Africa and Asia. We are very aware that street children need a voice and this podcast has been created to help make that happen. We'll share with you the first-hand experiences from our community working with street children, striving to make a difference to young lives. Welcome back to the Toy Box Stories from the Street podcast. We are about to embark on series two and we are talking about back to school this time. So as parents across the UK start to think about buying a shiny new pair of school shoes for the next school year, and we're all bracing ourselves for the flurry of those first day school photos on social media, we're going to talk about what's happening around the world with children getting back to school. And I'm joined today by Naomi from Team Toy Box. Um, Naomi heads up the International Programmes team. Welcome, Naomi. Thanks, Gemma. Um, so you've been working quite closely with Nepal since you joined us. Um, we know they've had their ups and downs, obviously, with the pandemic. It's been a really, really tricky time. Um, so let's talk about COVID. An estimated 90% of the world's school-aged children have had their education disrupted by the pandemic, according to UNESCO, which is huge, isn't it? And we know that we've experienced that at home ourselves. Um, what would you say is a fair reflection of what you've seen over the last year or more working alongside street children? Yeah, so definitely all of the countries where we work, um, which is um seven different countries across Africa, Asia and Latin America. In every single one of those countries, schools were closed for at least um, a few months and in many instances much longer than here in the UK. And for the vulnerable children that we support, this made their learning really difficult. Um, In many cases, there was no online provision, particularly at the beginning. And even where this was available in some cases later on, Um, children from very poor families and very vulnerable situations just don't have the devices to access online learning or even um, the internet at all. Um, What's been one of the knock-on effects that we might not immediately think of at home? Um, So there's a few but for the vulnerable children that we work with school offers not only a chance for education but also helps to keep them out of child labour and a difficult home life. Um, We conducted some research at the end of last year and we found that many of the young people and children that we support once they were out of school were having to help with household chores, looking after younger siblings and even going out to work themselves just to supplement their family income as that took such a huge hit um, because of COVID. So whereas in the UK, a lot of um, our children were at home watching more things on screens and looking to see how they could um, entertain themselves. um, These were children having to go out and find work. And some of that was quite risky um, as well. Um, School's also a place that children can play and have fun with their friends and not having that opportunity really affected the young people emotionally too Um, because that might have been their only opportunity to do that. Um, And another one is for for children living on the streets or um, at least their lives connect them to the streets very closely. They didn't have homes to go to to stay safe. Um, Instead, they had to hide from the police as they could be arrested for being on the streets. And for others, their shelter is very small, very basic, meaning that um, many people could be sharing one or two rooms um, and they just didn't have the the luxuries that we would have had um, to to be spending that time at home, um, you know, without computer games and toys and exercise equipment. um, But instead, we're just um, just cramped into a small space, um, wondering where the next meal was coming from. So not only the education was put on hold, it was access to so many of those other services that that we almost take for granted. Um, Absolutely. And she said the social side of things and seeing other children. I mean, for us, children don't go to work until they're, you know, maybe start an apprenticeship at 16 or they get a job after they leave school at 18. So what kind of ages of children are we talking about here that have missed out on school and and been going into work? Um, So even um, 10 to 14 year olds, 
um, would have been taking up um, jobs, trying to sell things. Um, we have got examples from our work in Nepal where young people were actually working in a crematorium um, because there was additional work with um, the deaths from COVID. And that was really heartbreaking to hear um, that that was what young people had to do in order to survive was actually um, helping to, to burn and bury the dead. That's unbelievable, isn't it? It's not something that crosses your mind while we're here and everyone's complaining about having their kids under their feet on the Wi-Fi. And the reality for these children is it is actually about survival. You've got nowhere to isolate. You haven't got the usual support system you might have in place. You know, that that regularity, that routine of school and where you, you can you can eat. And that's just all taken away. Um, it's Absolutely. unbelievable, isn't it, to find yourself working in that situation. It's quite, it's, yeah, it's quite moving, I think. So in, in terms of children, we know that there are some children who've had to take up employment within the city, within Kathmandu. What about the other children who aren't in the classroom? Where are they? So we know of some children that have um, migrated away. Um, so no, this means that our teams on the ground have, have lost touch with many of them. Um, so this has been both Nepal and also in our India project as well. Um, so some of these children will have gone when they've lost their income or their families have lost their income in the capital city. They've migrated to um, maybe stay with relatives who might they might feel are in a slightly better situation um, ju um, just so that they can you know, maybe have um, food on a daily basis. But that means that our partner staff lose contact with them and they lose their place in school. Um, we hope um, they will come back um, or that they will um, get back into schools where they are. But it's very difficult for us to know. And how how have the partners kind of taken on these additional challenges? We know that, you know, they played a huge part in these children's lives in terms of helping them away from the street or helping them into education or other programmes that suit the particular child. So how have they been working alongside street children throughout the pandemic in terms of education? So um, early on in the pandemic, uh, we work with our partners um, to reallocate up to 20% of their project budgets to mitigate the impact of, of COVID on the children and young people at a time when many of the activities couldn't take place because of restrictions. So this meant that the partners could tailor support based on needs um, and this might include food parcels or vouchers or stationery to do learning at home. Um, mobile top up vouchers so they could access the Internet at home for those who had mobile phones and also trainings um, by partners that they were doing online as well. Um, and in some cases, we supported the payment of rent for homes where they faced ev eviction and becoming homeless, where obviously that would mean they would have nowhere to study from at all and no safe space to, to sleep at night. Um, so our partners have been absolutely incredible and they have really sacrificed a lot themselves. Um, some of um, our partner staff have even were even living away from their families during the pandemic so that they could keep their own families safe and still go and um, keep in contact with um, the street connected people on the ground. Um, so they they try to keep in touch with the programme participants in, in various ways and, and just keep them engaged in their learning um, however they could, um, whether that's through online activities or through sports. And it was different in every country and dependent on, on each of the different contexts. So, um, for example, distributing worksheets they could do at home, um, sharing videos, um, sharing details of counselling helplines to get support. Um, and how they can access government help um, for other areas that they might be struggling with. Um, but, um, another one of our partners, um, so Chetna in India, even did a week long virtual summer camp um, that for young people with various activities such as yoga and arts and crafts, science, maths, all fun activities to encourage learning and, and to keep beneficiaries engaged during the lockdown. Um, and 
it was thanks to th those kind of efforts that meant that in the previous term, many of the young people supported by the project were in the top three positions in their class, um, which is incredible given everything that they'd gone through and the, the backgrounds that they come from. And it's the kind of support they received like um, additional revision classes when um, the educators realised that they'd been getting a bit behind um, or forgotten what they'd learned during the lockdown and just help them to keep that learning on track. Um, so yeah, some really good stuff going along, going, some really good stuff happening um, despite all the challenges as well. So it sounds like the momentum was really kept up. Those children must be so proud of themselves to what they've achieved in their class. I think it's incredible, isn't it? We, you know, the talk here about catch up plans and stuff for education and just to keep keep battling on and keep up all their hard work and then to achieve so much despite you know we must remember as well that they do have really tricky home lives so they're not going into their bedroom with their lovely big new laptop and tuning into their zoom classes so it's it's just amazing isn't it that they've managed to achieve so much despite such a difficult difficult period of time um so we know that for some people, online learning hasn't been an option. So where it's been available, obviously, it's it's really supported children to to get to the next level of their education or complete their education. Um, I know that there's a there's a, a quote here from UNICEF um, that says that at least a third of the world's and two thirds of Nepal school children have been unable to access remote learning during the school closures. So how did the, how was this kind of tackled in Nepal? I know that we can say Chetna has managed to keep up that online learning and keep that momentum going. Um, what did you find the, the partners over in Nepal were doing to, to try and combat this with it being so tricky with online learning? Yeah, so in Nepal, the online learning was only available for private schools. So the um, families on lower incomes um, could not access that learning and the, the schools that their children attended um, didn't have that kind of provision. Um, so um, when it was clear that the pandemic was going to last longer than expected and the schools were going to be closed for a longer um, time period, um, what our partner SASA in Nepal did was to adapt their project so that they initiated two mobile schools, um, which was just what the young people needed. So they set up um, and they got a van and educational supplies and teachers and they would go out to two different areas close to where um, the street connected children lived um, so they didn't have to to go very far and didn't have to um, break any laws about um, travel and um, so they went to where the children were and they set up um, those classes in an outdoor space the children could be socially distanced and they could continue with their learning um, and they did this um, for a few hours a day um, and so that meant that for those children who did still have to do household chores or um, did still have to help their parents with their small businesses, they could do that and not miss out on their education. Um, and then as um, online learning became more available, um, they helped um, a few children who needed to access that learning but couldn't at home to do so in their own learning centre. So they refurbished computers, they um, made sure they were connected to the internet and those young people came into the learning centre um, to do their learning there and benefited from other trainings as well like um, life skills training um, while they came into the learning centre. Um, so it was just great to make sure that these children didn't miss out. That is a, such an amazing effort, isn't it? We will bring school to you Absolutely. and to do it outside. It's lucky they've got better weather than we have. Um, but that is just phenomenal, isn't it? Kind of ticking off all the boxes, right? We can be socially distanced. We can be outside. We can bring school to you. We can fit it in around your other commitments or pressures in your life just to keep that momentum. And I guess to keep contact with those children as well, like you mentioned before, where children are moving away. Um, it must be so tricky you kind of you, you see all this progress for them and you you must not want you must not want that to drop off um for them to be able to see through to the next level of education 
Yeah, they're so invested in these children. Um, they get to know them. They they really want them to have um, a, di a future. And education is such an important part of that. Um, so even if it meant at times delivering um, worksheets to their homes or to where they were and stationary kits so they could um, plug away and, and keep doing things at home, that's what they would do. It's, it just shows such commitment, doesn't it, to the, the work that they do alongside the children and hats off, you know, jetting around doing mobile school when it's, you know, it's quite a scary time for all of us. It's all the uncertainty to kind of just keep on going and keep that momentum. It's, it's testament to the, the work of the, our partners, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we've started to see a decline in COVID numbers. It's up and down. We, we never quite know what's happening next. But where do you think this will leave children with their return to school? I know in Nepal, they go back to school around the same time as our children here in the UK, don't they? September time. Um, what do we think is going to happen next, particularly where children might have gone to work or have got a new routine or whatever's going on in their lives? What do we think is going to be next? them so it is going to be hard um in um across all of our countries that the schools in nepal have been enclosed um for more of the year than they've been open um and so they've missed almost a full school year um and during that time they've seen their parents and caregivers suffer from reduced incomes um and so they can't afford the school supplies needed, even where education is free. So primary education is free, but they need to have those other supplies. And yeah, many have got used to earning a small income themselves or, you know, having the freedom of not going to school. So for those most vulnerable children and those who really do need education to have a chance in life, um, it is going to be hard for them to get back. Um, and um there's also a knock on impact about availability of jobs so with hundreds of thousands of migrant workers coming back from india there's a huge pressure for jobs as well and um, which are in short supply so it is going to be hard to get for things to return to how they were but for those children who have been engaged with our projects it will be that much easier because they're not um they have been kept engaged um, as much as possible. They have been keeping up with some of their learning. And so um, we're confident that they will be able um, to continue with their education. But there, there are going to be some um, who slip through the cracks, unfortunately. And I guess for some of those children, when we, we look at the sort of look at it from the top, there are going to be children who've lost key family members that, you know, the, there's going to be, as you said, maybe less jobs, but the debts that people might have taken out to get them through the period we've just been through. How do they recover from that? And as you've said, if the children have got used to having an income or the families used to that income coming in, is that going to make a difference to their being able to return to school? Yes, certainly. So it's almost considered a luxury, especially for for girls. Um, it tends to be the boys who are prioritised for education and um, more than the girls. And so the families will have difficult decisions to make. Um, and so another component of SASAS work is to work with parents and caregivers on the importance of education and encouraging them to keep um, their children in school and to reinforce the messages about staying in school and so that has continued to happen as well and that's a really important component of the project as well um, to help keep children in school. When we're thinking about the barriers that street children might have had to learning before COVID, before we saw that bombshell drop and kind of disrupt education, what did it look like before the landscape for street children in terms of accessing education and learning? So it's different for um, different children. It depends on the particular factors that pushed them or pulled them to the streets or to street connected life. Um, but generally, most children are from very poor and marginalised households and their parents may not have gone to school. So their parents um, may not value education um, and many need to provide an income for their families or um, they've run away from home. They might have run away from difficult home lives. And so they're, they're making it 
on their own. Um, and some may have been in school previously, but may have felt um, stigmatized or may have felt sort of on the outside um, because of their lifestyle and preferred the freedom um, of dropping out. So there are different factors, um, but it's interesting that uh, a 2014 study in Nepal indicated that poverty and a mother's education provides an important determining factor as to whether children are out of school. Um, and this is very much interconnected with their social status. And if they have a lower social, social status, it is more likely that they will not be in school. Um, so the the bridge project that SASAT operates is is really really helps in this regard because it provides non-formal education and readiness classes to help prepare children for formal schooling so that it is not that they feel out of place. They they get to um, have learned the basics in a safe environment um, with other children from similar backgrounds and learn about life skills and learn about leadership skills and other things that will help them when they go into a formal school and help them to integrate much better. And that gives them a chance. And um, when they have children in future, they can um, pass on that um, education to them. That's really interesting. So they're not starting on the back foot. If you've not been to school from a very early age, or maybe you did drop out and you want to return, you're going to have that nervousness, aren't you? Because everybody's been going for a long time and everybody knows the routine. Everyone knows where you go for lunch or they know what happens at a certain time or how to behave or when to do this and that. So it's, it's almost a factor that hadn't even popped into my mind. But actually, you know, <laughs> it's like starting all over again, isn't it, for them? So, yeah, yeah that's, absolutely. That's so really interesting that that's part of the project. Yeah, no, that's a really important part. And then that this is why the project is called the bridge, because it just provides that bridge between the streets and um, into formal schooling, um, which is um, so needed because we want them at the end of the day to not just have basic reading and writing skills, but also um, have an education on paper. So have qualifications and um, be able to use that um, in future. So in terms of children getting back to school in September, we've talked about some of the kind of the barriers that children need to overcome. And you mentioned the stigma attached to kind of, you know, attending school as a street child. And we know that going to school, there are various bits and pieces that you need to take along with you. We all know that we've all got the very long list. Hopefully, you are not all panic buying in September and you started early, but it's the same situation, isn't it? Doesn't matter where you are in the world. Children need a school uniform and they need their stationery and equipment. And as we've just talked about, having those those difficult financial circumstances can't make that easy for children. And, you know, you, you don't want to be the odd one out who doesn't have the school uniform. Is You know, I'm assuming is school uniform is part of the rules. You have to have that if you go to school in Nepal, just as you mm. do here. Um, so, do, you know, do we recognise that that is a challenge faced by street children and their families is actually having all the bits and pieces that you need to go to school? The education might be free, but there are still associated costs. Yeah, so um, they they can't go to school unless they have the uniform and unless they have um, these stationary items that are not provided by the school. And that might not feel like a lot to us, um, but when you're you know, earning um, a pound, two pounds a day, um, that's a huge amount of money and that's money that you would otherwise spend um, on a meal um, for yourself or for your family members that day. So um, the um, support from Toybox really does enable these young people to have an education and to get back into school. So we are currently running a back to school campaign to support street children in Nepal to return to school next term. As part of that, supporters can gift a stationery kit for £6 or a school uniform for £14. Um, you've just heard how important those materials are and the challenge that the street children that Toybox works alongside are facing to get back to school. So we're very grateful for any support that we receive. Um, that our partners can use to support those children in getting back into education or taking that first step into their education. 
thank you so much for joining me, Naomi. It's so interesting and it always is because I never know how this is all going to turn out on the podcast. So I'm really excited. I just want to say thank you so much for opening my eyes to what's been happening over in Nepal. Great to chat. And um, yeah, thanks for um, sharing the stories of um, the children in Nepal that we're working with. So if anybody wants to find out anything else about the work of Toybox, our partners, the Back to School campaign, please visit our website, check out our social media channels. You are very welcome to call us anytime to find out a little bit more about what we do or how you can help. So thanks for listening and we'll be back again soon with the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to the Stories from the Street podcast. We'll be back soon. If you've got any questions for us or you'd like to find out more, you can email us at supporters at toybox.org or visit our website www.toybox.org.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Goodbye for now and thank you for listening.